we have learned so far the benefits of functional programming and the basics of Scala programming language. This session onwards, we will real, really experience on how we could solve problems using functional programming concepts. Basic building blocks of any functional programming language is the functions. Functions defines some specific actions. So those actions should be as small as possible. And it has fixed kind of inputs and outputs. The way we define this function we should define in function in such a way we should be able to reuse them in the future applications. So as you may remember, we started with Scala prompt. And at the prompt we type one one, it returns two. So so in case we want to add some uh, we want to implement some function to adding numbers we can write something like that. So we can define using def keyword, a function called sum, and it has those two inputs, both are integers, and it output type is also integer, the colon we give the output type, and then after equal sign, we give statements, which we need to execute. So basically the last statements of the statement block is the return return value. So here we have only one statement. So because of that, it returns addition of x and y. So this is what we call the function definition of the function header. It tells the system there is a function called sum as two inputs, type of those two inputs are integers and return value is integer. So then this function can be used at any time. So for example, when you type sum one one, it returns two. So that is a basic example of a function. I will show you the demonstrations later on. So in the, in Scala, the function declarations has the following form. Starting from this keyword, function name, any name, but you should be give a meaningful name. So while beginning, when you start functional programming, you should, you should learn to give good function name. And after that, list of input parameters, and then the colon, and we test the return type. A function definition, this is function declaration. The function definition has the following format. So this is a declaration on the top. And then after that, we put an equal sign and then define the function body. So this first part here up to that is the declaration. And then after that, we define what we want to do in this function. So it might have one statement, or what we call one expression, or more than one expression. If you have more than one expression, the expression is the return time. So that's how Scala function definitions look like. So as you, re as you may remember, we wrote a function to convert centigrade into the Fahrenheit. So it has only one expression. So that is 35, whatever the centigrade value multiplied by 1.10 plus 32 is the declaration, sorry, is the e expression or the statement of this uh, conversion. So we can use that statement directly, but as you know, if you want to convert another centigrade value, we have to write it back. But instead of doing that, we can declare a function for that. So then this function can be used at any time when you want to convert centigrade to Fahrenheit. Similarly, I have given a problem to convert you or the calculate volume of sphere. So there is an equation 
to convert this polynomial square at the given uh, the radius. So if you want to calculate the polynomial square at the radius five, so we can define, oh, this is radius three, for example. So we can define the R, value R called three, and then we can multiply or we can calculate or we can write this expression directly to find the volume. But if you do so, as you may understand, so every time when you want to find it down to a volume of sphere, we need to retype this expression. So instead of, instead of, we can write a function for that. So for example, if you want to write a function to convert Fahrenheit, a centigrade to the Fahrenheit, so we can implement a function called f if you want. So the f function take an input that is a single, in, a double value, it has the decimal numbers, and in the scala, return type is optional. So if you want, we can put colon and then type double here. So that is optional. So we can omit it easily because scala automatically identify the return type by looking at the expression. So our expression is whatever this input x here, it is matched to that. This, this is x declared here, x multiply 1.8 plus 32. So similarly, in order to calculate the volume, so we can define a function called volume, something like here. So there we say volume, input is one parameter, that is radius r, type of that is double. Obviously, return type becomes double, so it is, we can put that or we can omit that, that's fine. So we put equal sign and then write our expression. So whenever we call this f function or volume function, f is centigrade x, and the volume r with the radius, it returns corresponding answer. So as you may understood now, how the pure functions look like, it would be very good if, you, if that sub kind of function definition have only one statement or one expression. Sometimes when you define function that might have several expressions. So in such case, as I mentioned, last expressions returns the output. The functions, so if I summarize what we discussed so far, functions as one or more inputs, perform calculation using only the input parameters based on the input. We should not use any global output or global variables while calculating the functions. Then it returns value. So always returns the same value for the same input. Does not affect any data outside the functions. And also it not affect by the any data. It does not affect any data outside the function and it's not affected by any data outside the function as well. There are no effect from outside to the inside. So the function should not update or change any data outside world plus the whatever the actions in the function should not depend on any data from the outside world. So that's how PO functions works. And that's that's are the feature feature of any PO functions. Now let's have a problem and try to find it out, the solution to those functions. Problems are, so you can read the problems. So, problems are, uh, let me show the problems first. Our problem is, so let's say first problem is, I run two kilometers at easy pace for eight minutes, and then I run uh, three kilometers at tempo, tempo pace in seven minutes, and then two kilometers at easy pace again to the race to the home. Then the problem was, what is the total running time? 
So in the second, it says, suppose the cover price of the book is rupees 24 and 95 cents, but it gives 40% discount and shipping costs for three, uh, rupees three for the first 50 copies and 75 cents for each additional copy. So then it has what is the total wholesale cost for 60 copies. So you see there are two simple problems. If you want to solve these problems using functional programming, we need to break down that problem to two small expressions or what you call small set of functions. Let's take the first problem. When you read the first problem, as you may see, we have we have we can see two sub problems there. So first one is I need to calculate the time when when I run in the easy phase. Then I want to write another function to calculate the time when I run at tempo phase. So then, as you may understood, total running time is a function of easy phase and the tempo phase. So we can solve our first problem using few small functions as follows. So I write a function called easy, which take input integer and calculate the time, x multiply eight, right? So x is the uh, kilometer. So two kilometers, and this is eight minutes per kilometer. My speed is eight minutes per kilometer. So because of that, if someone, the function take input x, so that is kilometer, then multiply it by the speed, so we can get time, to run this kilometer. So the function I implement for that is called easy. Then I write a function to calculate the time in the tempo phase. So there I, my function name is tempo. Again, take integer as input, input value. One input, that is integer, that is kilometers. And then the return value is kilometer x multiplied by the speed. So that is the time for run the given kilometer. So these two functions are ready. Then problem says, I run two kilometers for easy phase, then I can calculate the time for easy phase, that is easy two. Then plus three kilometers for tempo phase, then tempo three, then plus three kilo, two kilometers from the, for the easy phase. So then if I execute those, expression like then so I get total time so you see my problem is divided into two small sub problems so using those two sub functions actually I can solve the same similar problems so for example if uh, if someone write if someone run five kilometers from easy phase and ten kilometers from tempo phase then obviously I can calculate the time he, he will going to take to complete that run. Like that, these small functions which we have implemented can be reused. Right. Now let's, uh, let's look at our second problem. In the second problem, we want to calculate the total price. In, this total, in order to calculate this total price, we can see several sub-problems. The first problem, we need to uh, uh, in order to solve the first problem, that is actually calculating the total price of the book. So maybe we can implement or define a function for that. So I wrote a function called book price, which take an input as number of books and return the total price of the book. So in order to get the total price, what I should do, multiply input into the price. So I, I get the total price for the book. And then this bookshop gives the discount. So for, then I, in order to calculate the discount, I can implement a function called discount. So in the discount function, you see, I'm taking the amount, total amount of the bill, and then calculate the discount. So in this problem, it say discount is 40%. So in order to find the discount, I multiply the input value, total bill value, in 0 0.4. So that returns the discount value. Then there is a 
other part of this problem that is to calculate the shipping cost. So there is a uh, expression or the equation given for calculating the shipping price. I implement a third function to find the shipping cost. So this third function name is called shipping cost. Take the number of copies going to ship. So the price is, shipping cost price is, as you remember in the problem says, in the first 50 copy, it is three rupees. Uh, uh, first, uh, let's see, it says uh, uh, three uh, rupees, three for first 50 copies and 75 cents for each of additional copies. That is the equation. So, so I have implemented that. So in the three rupees for X copies, then uh, actually this is, I made a mistake here. As you may see in this, my function is kind of uh, wrong. Uh, so X minus 50, that is actually the, if copies are larger than 50, that is 75. Then, X multi, three multiply X. So if you have like, kind of like say, uh, 60 copies, then, uh, so first 50 should be three, and then rest, it should be 75. So as you may understood this, my shipping calculation function is wrong. So for shipping cost is three for first 50 copies and 75 cents for additional copies. So, we, so the first 50, if, so then I need to have some condition here. So if, if actually this, this equation I have given is kind of wrong in, to calculate the shipping cost here, as you may understood, because in the first 50 copies, so it should be three rupees, then that means three multiply 50. And then each additional copy, that is X multiply X minus 50 is the additional copy, then it should be 75 cents. So this equation, this should be 50 in case X larger than 50. If X, la is, if X smaller than 50, so this part is not there. So actually this uh, shipping cost function is wrong in my implementation as you may understood. So you can think about that and implement the correct function of the shipping cost. When I do the demo, I will show you how it should look like. Right. So anyhow, if I if we implement good price, discount and shipping cost function, total cost, Calculation of total cost for 60 copies is easy. That is book price minus discount plus shipping cost. Right? So that's how we can divide the problem into a small set of functions and then join those functions together to get the final answer. Okay. So you might think about why, why it is worth, why do we divide those into the small set of functions? It is, is, is it worth? Actually, we are doing it for several reasons. First reason is if you do it, or if you divide it into small functions, we can very easily reuse those elements. And we can easily test them because it might have only one expression. So as you may understood, so my shipping cost functions is wrong. So I immediately identify that, that the, my shipping cost equations are, were wrong. So I managed to do that because it has only one expression. So if you have a big, very big set of expressions all together, I may not identify the errors easily. So some functions which we implemented for solve some problems, may later on can be used in, to solve some other problems as well. So in general, when you divide 
a big problem into the small set of function uh, problems and implement functions for each and every small problems. So it is easy to debug, easy to understand, and then it is reusable, and most probably it is error free. Right. So let's try to further understand the beauty of functional programming and how do you use reuse those functions in to solve different applications. Let's try to understand those using some other problems. Okay. So there is a problem I given to you here. It has to calculate the area of this with radius r is given. So equation to calculate the area of, of a disk is pi r square. So r is the radius. So then I want to calculate the area of the disk with radius is pi and maybe some other values. So then, so I need to, so if I want to solve this problem, obviously I need to implement a function for that. So maybe a area of a disk may be a good name for this function. So then, so it should have one input. So that is the radius, single input. So then this function should have returned the area where the calculation is based on this equation. So if we want to implement a function for that, so that is how simple Scala functions look like. So I define, I, using def keyword, I define a function called area of this. It has single input that is radius x and return value is double. So this double part is optional, but anyway, I have given that here. And then it put equal sign and give the statements or expression. Here this expression is x square math pi math pi. Actually, this is not r because my uh, area of this here, x, so then this should be x multiply x square math pi, right? You see, I made a mistake here again. If this is x, so this should be x. If this is r, then input type is r, then this is r square math pi. It's my return type. So if I implement a function like that, then I can call it like with the value, so then it returns the answer. So you see, even this mistake I have done here, I identify immediately because this is a single statement. We can clearly or easily debug. Right, let me now show the reusability. So we assume we have implemented this area of these functions and tested, and we know now it, it is error free, it works perfectly. And later on, in some other problems, we want to calculate the area of the ring. So if you want to calculate the area of the ring, so we, want, we don't want to do it from the scratch now, because we already have area of the circle or, or, or area of the kind of, area of the disk, right? So we already have that function implemented, uh, area of the disk function. So because of that, so we can directly solve area of the ring. So as you may understood, area of the ring is, can be solved, area of the ring can be solved using area of the disk, how? Oh. So what we want to calculate the area is, this, area is actually this bigger area minus the small area. So that's how we could calculate area of the ring. So then we can implement a function, we call it as area of the ring. It should have two inputs as you may see, the radius of outer area and the radius of inner area. So we have put the two inputs values and, and we get the return. The return value is basically area of the disk of X, outer area, minus area of the disk of Y, inner area. So that is the area of the ring. So we have reuse area of the disk functions for doing that. So if you want to then calculate the area of the 
uh, ring for given two radius in an outer. So we can call area of the ring something like that, 10, 15, it returns the value. So you see, so we have reused the area of these functions to solve the area of the ring function. Similarly, we can solve this particular problem. So in this problem, what we want to calculate is area of a cylinder. So when you take area of the cylinder, you see it's a curved surface and two disk surfaces are available. So we already have a function implemented for area of the disk. So then if you want to solve this problem, we need another function to calculate the area of the rectangle. Because if this, when you take this curve, curve area, so it is a kind of rectangle when you kind of look at that. That is height, this part is height. This is the diameter. This one is the diameter, this one is the height. So perhaps if you can implement a function called area of rectangle, so area of the cylinder is a kind of function of area of this and area of rectangle. So let's have a look how to solve this. So I create a function area of this already. Input is radius, return type is this. We have it already implemented. And then we, we need to implement a new function called area of rectangle. We take a width and the height as the input. So if width and height given, area, area is width multiply height, you know that. So then we have these two functions. Area of a cylinder is function of area of this and area of rectangle. You understand that. So then easily by using these two sub functions, we can define the function called area of cylinder. So our area of cylinder functions take a radius and the height as input parameters. And then we can using other two sub functions, we can get the answer. How, how, do, how do we get it? So we have two disk surfaces. So we call the area of this with the radius multiplied by two, we get the area of the disk surfaces. And the curved surface area we want to pass, this is the length and the height. So the radius of a circle is, you know, two multiply pi r. So we say two multiply pi r radius. So that is the length of this rectangle and then we pass height. So it returns the area of rectangle. So we get the area of this surface. So then area of cylinder is area of this surface plus two, two of area of this. So that is how we implement a function called area of cylinder. So then we can pass parameters to that like area of cylinder. This is radius and this is the height of the cylinder. It returns the area. So you can call these functions in many ways. So if you want to get in with two decimal places, so we can use printf function with the formatted string. So we say printf and give a formatted string. Point 0.2 means with two decimal places, f means we need is a 14 point number. So then we call area of cylinder with two inputs values, radius and the height. It returns the answer with two decimal places because with the formatting string we I asked to do so. So you see, we have solved this function, a problem using existing functions that demonstrate you the reusability of functions. Okay. Now take a little bit little complicated problem. So in the problem says there is a company and it pays 150 for no, normal working hours for the employer and 75 rupees per 40 hours. And it says typically persons work 40 normal hours and 20 40 hours per week. And it further says, so this company take 10% tax to the government. So finally it asks to implement a function to calculate the take home salary of the employer. How many functions can you identify that? 
in order to solve this problem, how many fractions can be identified? If you are a bad programmer, you may implement this everything in one one function. So, so if you do so, you do very bad functional programming. So you should be able to identify small stuff problems by looking at this big problem. In other words, you should write your algorithm to solve this big problem by using small subset of problems. How many problems you can identify in this in order to solve this? How many problems can you be can you identify in order to solve this problem? How many? So first, obviously you can understand there should be a function to calculate the amount for normal working hours. Then we need to have a function to calculate the, the payments for 40 hours. Then perhaps, then we need a function to calculate the tax, right? Basically his salary is normal working hour plus OT hour minus tax, right? So then we can write small functions for that. So these are the things we know we need. We need to calculate the salary wage. These uh, working hours multiply the rate. And this is how we get the salary for OT hours. That is hours multiply the rate of OT. Income is normal wage plus OT. Then by giving the income, we need to calculate the tax. Then basically take home salary of him, the employee's income minus tax. So these are the functions we need then. So our, the, the higher or that function is take home salary. So it take two functions in order to calculate these two, we can use the rest of sub functions. Then how do you implement this? In Scala or any other function and programming language. Yeah, it might look like Scala. So we define a function called wage. It take uh, one input, that is hours, number of hours this person works and returns the payment. Payment means hours multiply the rate. Then we need to implement a function called OT. It has a one input, that is OT hours. Then we multiply OT hours with the rate, we get the payment. Then we implement a function called income. So income take two inputs. So they are regular working hours, H1, and the OT hours, H2. So then we pass H1 to, the, to calculate the wage function, and H2 to the calculate OT function. So we add them together, that is the answer of income. So we, we can implement a function called then tax. So tax is, when you pass total income, so tax is income multiply 0.1, that is tax is 10%. So this is our tax function. So then we could implement the take home. Take home function should take two inputs. So that is H1 and H2. H1 is the normal working hours. H2 is the OT hours. So return time is double, obviously. After equal sign, we implement the function. So function uh, definition is, we need to first calculate the total income. That is this function. We pass H1 and H2 to that. Okay. So when you pass that, it returns the employee's total income. Then we have to reduce the tax from it. So we call the tax function. The tax function require income. So because of that, inside the tax function, we call the income function again with H1 and H2 given. So then what's happened? So H1 and H2, when we input this H1 and H2, is passed to the income function and calculate its total income, and then pass H1 and H2 again to the income function, 
get the total income and pass that total income to the tax function and get, get then get returns the tax value and then system will produce tax from the income return is take home seller so that's how we simply solve this problem all those functions we use basically we call it as pure functions because they have fixed inputs and outputs and always when you have same input it always produces the same output right so in order to understand the function programming functional programming and the concepts let's take let's consider some complex problem so in this complex problem it has the store and after that it asks you to calculate the optimum point so the story you can have a look it says there is a theater it shows some dramas and then there is a ticket price so by doing small research the owner of that theater find it out if ticket price is rupees 15 150 people attend this performance so then he realized if he decrease in this ticket price by five rupees so attendance will increase by 20 and similarly if you increase the ticket price for example to the ticket price to 20 rupees increase the ticket price by 5 rupees that means ticket price get 20 the attendance will decrease by 20 so that's he found found out so for example if ticket price is 15 120 people will attend if reduced by 5 rupees that is ticket price is 10 140 people will attend similarly if ticket price increase by 5 rupees that is 20 rupees attendance will reduce that is 100 person will attend so he found the equation depend on the number of attendees ticket he said he, 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 yeah, he identified number of attendees is depend on the ticket price so number of attendees function of the ticket price right then he want to find it out its cost so in it really the owner realized that every performer's cost minimum rupees 500 and each attendee cost additional three rupees usually there is a base cost of 500 rupees and then there is a cost for each attendee that is three rupees per attendee. So that is his cost to run this show. So in this problem, we ask what would be the best price for him to maximize his profit? Okay. Can you identify the functions required for that? So can you divide, in other words, can you divide this problem into small sub problems? So obviously, we need to calculate the profit. Profit is a function of income and the cost. So profit is income minus cost. So this should be the first one function. Then, so there is a function to calculate the income. Its income totally depends on the ticket price. So its income function is number of attendees multiply ticket price right then there is a cost the equation for cost is given here so similarly we need to function to calculate number of attendees equation to calculate number of attendees also given here then perhaps using those functions we can calculate the profit at each ticket price how do you do that so as i said we can divide this into the set of sub problems, simplify the problem into the set of sub problems. First of all, the profit. We need to have, we need to implement a problem. Okay, we need to implement a function to calculate the profit. Profit is the difference between revenue and the cost. 
then we need to function revenue this exclusively depend on the ticket price then we need a function called cost it consists of two parts that is fixed part and the variable part variable part depend on the number of attendees then finally we need the statements to find it out the number of attendees at each ticket cost how do we code these functions so let's start with the attendee function in the basic attendees is 120 so so it varies plus and minus based on the ticket price so base price is 15 so if ticket price when you use ticket price minus the new ticket price 15 minus new ticket price let's say we decrease the ticket price then it is by five rupees that is let's say 10 rupees 15 minus 10 so this is five what we do to get this number of attendees so you you know we divide five by whatever this answer by five then we can identify how many more times we increase the ticket price if it is increase uh, how many times increase or decrease if it is in decrease by five uh, 10 rupees that is two times five so the ticket price is five right so then 15 minus 5 is 10 10 divided 5 is 2 2 multiplied 20 is 40 so then then we get additional 40 attendees if the ticket price is 5 rupees you see we get additional 40 attendees if ticket price is 10 rupees we get additional 20 attendees so similarly we increase the ticket by let's assume that is uh, let's assume uh, that is kind of uh, 20 rupees then 15 minus 20 is minus 5 minus 5 divided 5 is minus 1 multiply 20 is minus 20 so we decrease the number of attendees by 20 so you see this simple equation will use the number of attendees when we input the ticket price right then we need to calculate the revenue revenues number of attendees plus multiply price then we need to find, find the cost cost is base cost plus three multiply attendees so then we need the profit profit is revenue minus cost so these are the functions to solve the given problem so we then call it using any functional programming language so i use scala to show that so here my function i define the function attendees my input is ticket price so my output is the equation i develop 120 plus 15 minus price divide 5 multiply 20. similarly my revenue function is a has input that is number of uh, ticket price every function as input input is number of ticket price then uh, in order to calculate i have to get then get the attendees because so then i call the attendee function by giving this price and then revenue is number of attendees multiply the price so using attendee function i can get the number of attendees by giving the price here and then I multiply by the price I get back the revenue so this is my revenue function similarly I can calculate the cost function by giving the ticket price I pass the cost uh, ticket price to the cost function then I calculate the cost cost is 500 plus attendees multiply 3 so here you see I made a mistake here again so I forget 3 so it should be 500 plus attendees multiply 3 so that is the cost so these are the three basic functions so then my profit is revenue minus cost my profit is revenue minus cost so i call it in scala profit my input is the ticket price 
then my profit is, I pass the ticket price to the revenue, then minus cost. I pass the ticket price to the cost function. So if I want to then find it out the cost for five rupees, I call the profit function using the ticket price five. I call the profit function using ticket price 10 and ticket price 15 and ticket price 20. So then each ticket price, you see, these are my profit, 147, 760, 1,180 and 1,400. If the ticket price is 20, my income becomes 1,400. So it's increasing. So let's now try the profit for 25, 30, 35 and 40. You see when, I, when the profit at 25 rupees ticket price 1,420, if the ticket price become 30, the number of attendees further decrease and my profit get decreased after that. So because of that, so you, we can identify, we can identify the best ticket price is 25 rupees. I can get maximum profit at the ticket price is 25 rupees. So you see now how good functional programming is. We can basically, if you have very big problems using functional programming, we can divide this big problem into the small set of sub functions. So then we can combine those sub functions to solve the big problem. So each sub functions may consist of one or two small expressions or statements. So then we can easily identify errors. So as you may see, even during this session, I have identified a few errors in my code. If it is a huge code with thousands of lines, it is not identified. It is not easy to identify errors. It is hard to do that. But if you do like this, using one or two lines in each function, so we could easily test those functions and we know these small functions are perfectly correct. If it is so, our big function, which use those small function is also correct. So that's why we say the functional programming are kind of, kind of error free, less errors if you do functional programming. Similarly, you understood. So functions we wrote for some can be reused for others. Like area of this has reused with area in green, area of green. So you, reusability is also there. So with modern concurrent and parallel programming, we can actually assign those functions into each small actions, what you call services. So microservices, sometimes we call them as microservices. So then we call those small and small services or small and small functions implemented to solve our problems. So if you have a huge set of such tested problems or te tested functions available, so solving a new problem is kind of engineering task, putting those problems functions together so it may we can get an answer for that so that's why functional programming again get popular in the modern context and we have to learn by looking at our problem we have to learn how to divide that problem into the small set of sub problems so then that's it so I will show those demos in a separate video. Thank you.